You guys have your Bibles, why don't you open those this morning to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to be taking a little walk this morning into the promised land and looking at uh, some things that I've discovered about my own walk and along the way as well. Um, So let me just pray real quickly. Father, just thank you for the day. Thank you as Bob prayed. Uh, Lord, just open our hearts um, that we might receive, Lord. Lord, we need to be nourished in our souls, and we need that nourishment to come from your word. And Father, just uh, pray you would meet each of us right where we're at this morning. Encourage us, give us hope. And uh, Lord, just, um, uh, just whatever you want to do, we lift it up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> There's a fan blowing somewhere. It's okay. It feels good. All right. So I think it was sometime this summer that um, Pastor Brian posted something online, and <clears throat> I don't always go there, but this kind of popped out because it has, had his name attached to it. This is what it said. It said, those who say, if you become a Christian, your troubles will be over. They have no clue what a Christian is, for that's where the war really begins. Would you agree with that this morning? I think that's it's really the context of what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, you know, Pastor Brian spent a couple of weeks in Ephesians chapter 6, and um, there's a lot of parallels between Joshua chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, it's always good to find those comparisons in the Old and the New Testament, and you know, there's something about our walk and the things that we go through in our walk, and God is always working in that. And so God's given us this book right here as an example of not just reading it and turning the pages and moving on, but God wants us to see it as real people, real time for us, even though it's happened maybe 1,400 years ago as the story we're looking at today is. And... Uh, there's always something for us. It's an example to us in our walk. So as I was sitting in those messages and looking at Ephesians chapter 6, I <clears throat> glanced over at Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, there was one verse that, that kind of jumped off the page at me because it, it had to do with uh, our Christian walk. And, and it said, God is wanting us to walk circumspectly. I had to stop for a minute and look that word up because I wasn't sure what it meant. But basically, it means to walk diligently. It means to not uh, have an on and off switch in your Christian faith. God wants you to be walking every day, every hour of the day, every minute of the day with Him. And yet, as we're going to see this morning, that um, that's not always the case. We have two things happening. There's, there's the Christian walk, which can start out in the wilderness, and it should proceed into the promised land, but sometimes it doesn't in our lives. And so Israel's delivery is, is a picture from Egypt, the bondage in Egypt. It's a picture of redemption. You know, the Bible is a book of redemption, you know, God has bought us for a price. He's purchased us. And that would be a picture in the Old Testament of the Israel being, you know, uh, the picture of them being bought and redeemed and brought in into a place of salvation. In the New Testament, of course, it would be Jesus, his death and resurrection and the cross. And even though we've been redeemed, sometimes we... We don't really engage or understand that wandering around in our Christian life as as people did in the wilderness for 38 plus years wasn't really what God had in mind. That wasn't the end of the story. That was only the beginning of the story. In God's mind, He wanted us to move out and He wants us to trust Him and He wants us to go into these places that require Him to be in control of our lives because the life that we live as a Christian, it's a spiritual life and it's a spiritual battle. And so there's territory to be taken 
and you're part of God's army. You're part of his team, and he uses Christians in his kingdom to take back his kingdom. When I got saved in 1981, I'm dating myself right now, sorry about that, but, um, you know, I was baptized in Southern California, and um, that, was, that was kind of my crossing the Red Sea experience into the wilderness. And I kind of walked in the wilderness for a number of years. I never really was discipled. Um, I was in and out of church. But the world was still too close. But I love God. I felt the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit to, to move in the direction of God. But at the same time, I was in the wilderness. I wasn't where God wanted me to fully be. One night at a Christian uh, men's conference up in the mountains, uh, after the message, went out and I was with a buddy of mine and we were looking up at the stars and they were beautiful and God had spoken to me and spoken to him and he says, uh, do you want to receive the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, I do. And he says, I don't even really understand it. I don't know where it is in the Bible, <laughs> but... We prayed that night, and I went home that night, and uh, my wife kind of looked at me and saw something different in me, and I suppose she thought it was going to change the next day, but it didn't change. And not that things were perfect, but I had this heart desire to walk with the Lord and to go deeper, and that was my crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land experience. And it's been a great experience. It hasn't been easy at times. But the difference is, is that when you go into the promised land, um, you're walking in God's power, and you're not walking in your own power. Some people get that baptism immediately the first time they get saved. But, you know, it's always available. And if you don't have that kind of baptism where the Holy Spirit is truly, by His, God's power, working in your life... Life can become, as a Christian, stagnant, and you can become just in this place of where you just settle for what you have. And God's saying in the promised land, he wants so much more for us. So you have to realize now that Moses is dead. Moses represents the law. Joshua is, is now leading. Um, biblically, the you know, the, the land west of the Jordan is the promised land. Um, a lot of times people think of the promised land as being heaven, but it's not speaking of heaven. It's speaking of that spiritual walk in that life here on earth. God wants to do things in your life here on earth. He wants it to be a spiritual walk of promise for us. He wants wealth in our life, not a monetary wealth, but a wealth where... There's a richness in our faith, and, and we're growing in our walk continually. He wants us to have victory in our lives. And in the wilderness, it seemed like that wasn't happening so much for the people of Israel. So the wilderness was never God's intention for them to end that way. Um, there was an entire generation that was there in the wilderness, and it was a place of dryness for the people. They were never walking in the fullness of the Lord. And didn't Jesus say in John chapter 10 that he wanted to give us life and life abundantly? That's the life that Christ wants for us, each one of us today. He wants it to be an abundant life, okay? And so as we begin to look at this, we're going to back up a little bit to chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 12. And it says... Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. In the wilderness, God just continued to provide what they needed. They needed food, God gave them food. But here they are, crossing over the Jordan into the promised land, and as soon as they get there, there's amazing food. And, and food is relative to the fact that God, there's blessings for us that are food in this life as a Christian. But there is a difference because God gave it to them 
but it wasn't the same anymore. They had to go out and pick it and get it and eat it. And it's a picture of our spiritual walk, really. When you go into the promised land with the Lord, there's effort that needs to happen in that walk. We have to get involved. We have to spend time in God's Word. We have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time at church. We have to spend time in communion. All of those things are happening because God's teaching us. He's teaching us that he might just change things up over the course of time. It's not the same manna every day where you just sit back and you just take what God gives to you. God's asking us to get involved in the promised land. He's asking us to realize that this is a relationship, and we have to enter into that relationship and realize that as believers, our soul has to be nourished, or we will just become dry, dead Christians who really aren't getting to that place where God intends us to be. And so we need to engage in that. And, and Gilgal, the place where they're at once they cross over, Gilgal is a good place for us because it's a land of the promise, you know. Joshua was told that everything in the land was a gift. It was a gift. All they had to do was go and they had to take the gift. And he does the impossible. Sometimes those gifts, they seem impossible to us. Like, how am I going to get that gift? How do I get to that gift? And yet, God can do it. God's blessings are available to us. So it really comes down to how far do you want to go? And I guess that's the main question this morning. How far are you willing to go into the promised land? Are you satisfied where you're at? Are you willing to settle for less? God is blessing your life, but is there more that God wants us to do and has for you? And so it's a matter of really beginning to understand that. God's not going to force us to do anything. He's not going to twist our arm. And yet, His heart, His mind, His love for us is that He can see what we cannot see, as we'll see this morning. God sees it. And he knows what victories he wants us to have. He knows what territory he wants us to take. And yet we can't see it. And so this is a place where Joshua is going to come into the scene. Joshua has been made that man. He's going to be the leader of the nation now. It's not going to be Moses any longer. And when you stop and think about it, it's just like, that's a lot of responsibility to be the leader of a nation going into the promised land where they couldn't have done it before. But Joshua has been put in charge of that. He, didn't, he was a godly man, but he didn't have it all together. If you look at chapter 1, you'll see that over and over again it says the command to him was what? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Some of us need to hear that every day in our lives, don't we? We get up and we... We're, we're going to work, we're going somewhere into the promised land, and, and we're shaking in our boots. We're, we're scared. We don't know how to do this. And maybe that's the point, because if we don't know how to do it, then there's somebody that does know how to do it. And so in verse 13, we see who that somebody is. And it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, <clears throat> that he lifted his eyes and looked and beheld a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us? Or are you for our, our adversaries? And so he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. That must have been an amazing moment for Joshua. I mean, here he is responsible for all these people, this man standing in front of him with a sword drawn and... This mystery man, he doesn't know. I mean, it wasn't a bad question, was it? You know, 
hey, are you on our side or are you on the other guy's side? But the answer was no. You're asking the wrong question. What was the right question? The right question was that Joshua should have been asking was, am I on the Lord's side? And that's really what we all have to ask, isn't it? He's faced with this situation where he's facing face to face with Jesus. And he has to make that decision in his heart. Am I on your side, Lord, or am I on my side? And we see that in different places in the Bible where, you know, Moses comes down the mountain and here's this golden idol and the people. And what does Moses say to the people? He says, you got to make a decision. Whose side are you going to be on? And the Levites come to him and it wasn't good after that. Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, you know, at Mount Carmel, 450 Baal prophets. And what does Elijah say to them? You know, you guys, you got to make a decision. Who's going to be your Lord today? Is it going to be Jesus? Is it going to be these guys? Even as you get further after they've taken all the territory at the end of Joshua, Joshua says, the thought's still in his mind, but he makes the proclamation that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so that decision in our lives always has to be made. When I made that decision, I made it, but I didn't fully understand it. And I think sometimes a lot of people don't fully understand it. And then they come to face with things in the wilderness that they don't understand. And that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. You know, we can be satisfied with what we have in the wilderness. And sometimes we fully don't understand it. So what happens? We walk away from our faith. The little faith we have, we walk away from it. And God doesn't want that to be happening. So he says, it's the commander of the army of the Lord. So perhaps it could have been an angel, but that wouldn't be right because in the Bible, um, worshiping is inconsistent with angels. They, they would never receive worship, so they're not angels. Although he says, I'm the army of, I'm, I have a, I'm the Lord and I have an army. Okay? What army did, did this person have? Well, he was the commander of, of angels. Because the battle that we're in, the battle that Joshua was about to go into, it's a spiritual battle. You know, if we could see God's army right now, we would be very encouraged because they're all around us. And they're out there daily fighting on our behalf and assigned by God. And we have an amazing Captain Jesus that, that will take care of us. But Joshua sees this guy and all of a sudden, he realizes it is Jesus, and he says, my Lord, and he follows the instructions to remove his shoes. When he's removing his shoes, it's really just a picture of the world. You know, the ground is dirty, the world is dirty. You're in the presence of Almighty, and so, why, so you, need to, you need to take those dirty things off. You need to take them away from yourself, and Joshua would have been a man of the word to to rise to this level. He would have remembered that the man that Moses encountered at the burning bush, he knew that story. And, and so here he is. It, it, it's maybe processing. He's beginning to realize he's standing in the presence of Almighty God, Jesus. And he recognizes him and immediately understands that I'm, I'm his servant, Okay. And that was kind of a reflection, kind of one of those things that you would have to really stop and think about. Because there's an incredible responsibility that when you're put into a leadership role, you know, Joshua probably is looking at the assignment already of Jericho, the first battle. He's seeing all these people that he's leading into battle. And then all of a sudden he realizes that, ah, oh, I can rest because my Savior, this man, this captain of the Lord's army, he's in charge. I'm not in charge. I'm his servant. I'm the one that's going to be following him. I may have to give the orders, but the orders are whatever he tells me to give. And so here he is. It's called a Christophany. 
It's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. You see it a couple of different places. Um, in Genesis chapter 14, Abram, after having rescued Lot, as he's walking, he runs into this Melchizedek. He was called the king of Salem, or the king of peace. He was also called the king of righteousness. And as it talks about the priests in Hebrews chapter 7, I want to read to you what it says about this Melchizedek. It says, He was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But made like the Son of God, he remains a priest continually. That's pretty clear right there that he's not talking to a human being at that point. And that's what that is. And so here he is, Joshua, face to face with his Savior. An Old Testament, uh, you know, encounter with Jesus who's going to lead them on this first, uh, this first obstacle that's in their path. And so, when we get to chapter 6, as we are now, let's go ahead and read the first four verses of that. Now, Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands. Notice that that's past tense. It's already been done. He's given it to them. Just like he's going to give everything to you that he wants to give you know, throughout your life. It's king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. <clears throat> and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Joshua's probably thinking of this right now, going, man, my strategy was nothing like this strategy. And really, that's the case. Because a lot of times, God's strategy just boggles our mind. We don't understand what it is. We don't understand how he's going to do something. But if we allow him to lead us, he will do that thing. The reason it was confusing to Joshua was because priests... We're never in the military. And the Ark of the Covenant never went into battle. And according to Numbers chapter 10, ram's horns were to be used, but not trumpets. And there was never any kind of traveling on the Sabbath. So all of those things went completely against what Joshua understood from Old Testament law. And in verse 5 it says, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. The actual confrontation here was to take place on the seventh day. It would have been the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, as, as I mentioned, there wouldn't have been anybody doing anything. That's why a lot of the enemies of Israel would attack them on the Sabbath because they wouldn't fight back. But here, God's saying to do something totally different. <clears throat> and you, it just makes you wonder, you know, why was Joshua being told to violate the law? You know, Zechariah 14.3 says, and this is interesting, Then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations, and when he, as when he fought in the day of battle. Zechariah's prophecy here is concerning Jesus and his second coming. But notice what it says, as he fought in the day of battle. When did Jesus fight back? Could it have been Jericho? very possible that that's what he's talking about here. The point is, in the land of the promise, Jesus is in our midst. And if Jesus is in our midst in the promised land, rules and regulations and laws, they don't mean anything anymore because it's all about a relationship now. That's what's important. 
God's going to lead us by a relationship. We're free from religion. We're free from legalism. We're free from rules. We're free from routines. Traditions should fall away. All of those things. Because we have a Savior that personally wants to be involved in our lives. And that's what he's doing here. So for now, and for the future, Joshua is going to be looking to Jesus as his captain. We all have Jerichos in our life when we stop and think about it. Sometimes we're facing things in our life that we just, we have no answer for. As the people stood, as they began to walk around, as they looked at these walls, as they knew that there was going to be this battle and they were going to be fighting, it was, it was ominous to them. And sometimes there's things in our heart, sometimes our Jericho in our own lives it starts right in our heart. You know, the Bible says that we have strongholds, we have habits, we have things that are, are, we don't understand how we can get rid of that. We want to, we think about it all the time. Sometimes we try things on our own. Those are our Jerichos. Sometimes they're relationships that we have with other people. We just can't see beyond what it is that God has put us in front of that is bigger than life. And it's at that point when we just have to realize that we have to give it over to the Lord. He's our captain. He's the captain of the army that's going to get us there. And so, but we forget. Sometimes we forget. But until we get to that point, we're just, we're not going to have rest. There's going to be no rest in our hearts. We're going to be fighting our own battle, trying to take down those walls ourselves. Instead of realizing, you know, God's got this. God's going to do this in his own way. And it's bigger than life. I don't see how it can happen. And maybe it won't happen. You know, that, that's something that we have to understand too. But the Jewish people, they came that first time to the Jordan River and, you know, the spies came back and Joshua and Caleb and they said there's good stuff there. But what did they do? They dug in their heels. They said, we're refusing to go. Why did they say that? Probably because they were fearful. Sometimes we're fearful and we don't want to go do what the Lord asks us to do. We see with our eyes and we need to believe with our heart and have the faith. And they grumbled against the Lord. They were about to be given what they didn't deserve and what they couldn't earn, just like we are. And yet they didn't want it. And so for 38 years plus, they wandered around. We can relate to that, can't we? You know, it seemed unrealistic to them. It seemed impossible. Yeah, actually, it seemed like a cruel setup, you know. Why would you have me do something like that? You promised me this land of my own, and now I can see it, and there's all these people in it who don't want me to be there. I mean, we've all been in that place where you have to come to that place where you just say, I'm going to believe in Jesus. I, I don't get it. You see, the people in the wilderness, they had a fatal flaw in their thinking. They saw God as being in the way of what they were supposed to get and what they were supposed to have. And it caused their faith to be a weak faith when all the time it was actually part of God's plan. That was part of his plan. You know, and, and, and that's where they miss, they miss the mark with that. That's where you get to that place and sometimes you just, people just turn on the Lord because they can't see it and it's not going their way. And that Jericho and those walls aren't falling. But God alone can move mountains, God, as we'll see in a few minutes. He's a powerful God. He can do what we can't do. But until we make that decision to move into the promised land, to make him our captain, 
we won't have that transformation that's going to go on in our Christian life. And that's what he wants for us. He wants us to be transformed, to have the mind of Christ, to be more like him, to take territory for the Lord. What he wanted them to do was to pause. And so they did. And he wants us to pause too in our lives. When we get to that, the edge of that Jordan River where we can see Jericho in the distance and it's so big and maybe we're afraid and we don't know how he wants us to fight that battle. God would say to us what he said to the people. He said, stay on the edge of the Jordan River for three days. I want you to stay here. I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you to set yourselves apart for the Lord. What that means is that to, sometimes before we can tackle our Jerichos in our life, we have to die to self. We have to forget about the fact that we've tried it on our own and failed. We have to seek Him in His Word. We have to humble ourselves. We have to resist the devil and submit to God. We have to put on and put off. A lot of things happen in this life, and God knows that when we got saved, we're still sinners, and we still have flesh, and we still live in a world. And so you spend time with God before you can take territory for the Lord, recognizing that you have a need. And part of the consecration experience is sharing that openly, being transparent. Lord, I have a need talking to him about your identity. What is your identity? You're a child of God. Talking to him about your calling. What is it, Lord, you're asking me to do? All of those things were done in those three days before they crossed over the Jordan River and tackled what they didn't understand at all other than it was going to be a blessing for them. And so it all required faith. And faith can only take you so far. You know, at to some point, you have to go and you have to give it over and you have to give more over because God will challenge us that way in our walk. He'll, he'll ask us to go deeper into the promised land and at some point, we have to realize it's going to require a lot of faith. I'm not going to see where I'm going. I have to do this by faith and not by sight. And God will lead as we go. Verse 5, and it shall come to pass that you make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests... There are seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city. And let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. And so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout and then you shall shout. And so he had the ark of the, of the Lord circle the city going around at once then they came into the camp, and they lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And then seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And so they did for six days. But, on the day, but it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day 
<clears throat> and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, they only marched around the city seven times. And the seventh day it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So this procession is, is headed out. They're going to do this for seven days until the word is given. And what I see here is I see obedience, you know, cooperation with the Lord. You know, like I said before, there's always danger in trying to take what it is that we're not supposed to take for ourselves until it's time to go. There's silence. The Lord says, be still and know that I'm God. And so there has to be restraint sometimes. Sometimes when we're going through things where there's a Jericho in our life, we're not silent. We're reaching out to people. We're sharing things with people that maybe we shouldn't be sharing. We're not fully trusting in just the Lord for that. And he says, walk. You know, which reminds us that the people, even though God's doing the work, the whole thing is a walk, right? God's calling us to action. Anytime God shows us to do something, he, we're, it's not just going to happen. It might, but more than likely, it requires action on our part to, to be on God's team. And then finally, he says, shout, and um, the walls will fall down. It's interesting that he says, shout, and the walls will fall down before the walls fell down. And then he said, shout. As a Seahawk fan, you know, it's fourth and goal. I'm not going to start cheering for my team like they just scored a touchdown until they cross the goal line and they score the touchdown. That's when people go crazy. It's not before. So what's happening? Well, praise is actually what it means when it talks about shouting, but it's also anticipation. When God asks you to move out and do something for him, you have to have that anticipation that God is going to do it. And so the people were shouting because they believed that God was going to do this thing, and God did it. And so it's, it's, it's so cool when you stop and look at it that way. Now the city shall be doomed, verse 17, by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab and the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you should become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels and bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So further instruction is given there. So they do it. They, they go to that point, and, and here they are, and they've anticipated that the Lord's going to do the work, and God begins to do that work right before their eyes. And in verse 20 it says, And so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. And then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They took the city. I did a little research and found out that between 1929 and 1936, a Dr. John Garstan, a British school of archaeology in Jerusalem, excavated the ruins of Jericho. The walls enclosed um, were about seven acres around. He found evidence that the city had been destroyed around 1400 B.C., coinciding with Joshua's time. He found that the walls did actually fall down flat. The wall was double. Two walls were 15 feet apart. The outer wall was 6 feet thick. The inner wall, 12 feet thick. 
It was constructed on an uneven base of brick and, and mud mortar. And they were linked by houses built along the top, which explains Rahab's house. And there were indications that it was an earthquake that caused the outer wall to fall, dragging the inner wall and the houses along with it. There were indications that the city was burned and the possessions were still there. Amazing when you think about it. It begins to give you this picture of the power of God. You know, all we know is the walls fell. We don't know what made the walls fall, but God is the God of creation. He can speak and cause earthquakes. You know, Matthew 24, 7 says that the sign of the times will be famines, there will be pestilence, there will be earthquakes in various places, all of these things. And God can move anything. He can use this earth to cause things to happen that are going to progress and help us to take territory for him. They also found that in 1927, um, records showing that the Jordan River, this is in 1927, the Jordan River was held back 19 miles upstream, just like when they crossed over, probably by an earthquake. And the Jordan, it was stopped because if you go 19 miles upriver, there are clay walls that are like 40 foot high. And it says that an earthquake happened that year and those walls collapsed and it stopped the Jordan River for 21 hours. Interesting, isn't it? So, in Joshua chapter 10, Joshua's in a battle, and what does God do? God stops the sun, if you remember that, so he can complete that battle. Our God is a powerful God, and he'll use whatever it is that he needs to progress what it is he wants us to do. You know, we all saw former President Trump turn his head a quarter of an inch and not be killed. I mean, you think about it, and I've heard it from many Christians, like, that, that's not a coincidence, you know? God, it wasn't his time to die. And so God is working. He's working in all of this. He's working through his church. He's working to take back his kingdom. You know, um, Bob talked about Foothills Christian School, and one of the things that we try to do at, at school is we have to separate, you know, biblical language from the world's language. And the world is talking a lot about unity and about diversity and about social engagement and those types of things. But those things are important to the Lord as well. They're this different when you read, them, read about them in the Bible. He has different ideas for his church. He wants, as, as, as they marched around Jericho, they were being unified. And they'd been given the ministry of reconciliation. You know, you, you see that in a sense because we'd have to go back, but, but you know the story of Rahab and the two spies went in. And Rahab, if you read it, she believed in the Lord at that point in time. And they went in and they basically led her to the Lord. They saved her and her family. Jesus sent out 70 witnesses two by two because he had work to do. And so God is a God of unity. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. We don't think of diversity the same as he would, but we think of it as a biblical diversity. You know, we're men and we're women. They marched. They had different jobs to do. They had different talents. They had different gifts that God had given to them. And then social engagement, I mean, isn't that what God has called us to do, to be ambassadors? We're to be his ambassadors. We're his representatives out there in the world, you know, to be a light in the darkness, and that's what we do. So as we look at this amazing story and we take from it you know, little nuggets along the way. I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, actually, they're scriptures. In Philippians 1.6 says, being confident 
of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has started a work on us, and it's up to us to not become so satisfied. You know, I like where my life is, and I like where my ministry is, and all of these different things. But sometimes God says there's more territory to be taken. There's more I want to do out there. And we have to engage in that. We have to ask him in our time at the edge of the Jordan to, you know, share our hearts and, and reflect on that with us and begin to lead us in that way. Second Peter 1.3 says, As his divine power has given us all things pertaining to life, into godliness. He's given it to us. The promised land is there for us this morning, and we have to decide, are we going to be satisfied? Are we going to settle as they did in the wilderness for less? Or are we going to take what God wants to give us as we go forward? It's a beautiful picture of what God wants to do. We don't have any natural abilities to do what God's called us to do. I don't have a natural ability to stand up here this morning and do this. You don't in the things and the gifts and talents that you have. But we have to remember that God is the one, he's the gift giver, and he's the one with the, the ultimate plan of what he wants to do if we're willing to do it with him. Let's pray. Father, we Thank you this morning for just your grace and your mercy. And Lord, as we, we look at this picture of Jericho, Lord, um, I'm just reminded that there are people here this morning, Lord, that have a Jericho in their life, maybe in their own heart, maybe something they're looking at, a situation, a relationship something in the flesh. I don't know what it would be, Lord, but it looks too big. It looks like those walls. And I just pray this morning, Lord, they would have a heart to just give you the Jericho, Lord, that they could have rest, knowing that you're a God that has already given us the victory by Jesus and his death and resurrection on the cross at Calvary, Lord. You are a commander-in-chief, Jesus. Your grace is sufficient, your power, it's made perfect in weakness, Lord. Help us cling to those things today. Help us reflect on our own lives as we go out. <clears throat> we know, Lord, that the time is short and the signs are there uh, that you're coming soon and yet there's work to do. And you've got work for each one of us, Lord, if we're willing to do it, so... I just pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. Just ask that you would meet them where they're at. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.